don't run away when there's mismanagement. You correct it. Mm. And in our case, we know how the subsidies were mismanaged. You see? So we just have to correct that. Okay. And when we correct it, subsidies are important. And I'm saying that the professors are here. They can see it. Where, where on this earth a country has ever developed without subsidies? Well, the prof is here. And prof. today. And ask, today, ask from the question. Like, prof, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, it could be rhetorical, but then, but no, then, no, it's, this is not yeah, true, because he's the only if you can tell us, so he has to, he has to If you us. can tell us which country <laughs> eh, has ever developed without subsidies, and even today, which country is able to manage its resources and economy without applying strategies here and there, you know, it's a tool. So yesterday, of course, we had uh, that program, the Agric uh, Manifesto, and of course, focusing on the political parties and what they will have to bring to bear when it comes to agriculture in our country, Ghana. You just heard uh, speaking there, Edward Karawe. And uh, we also hear from the CEO of the Chamber of Agribusiness, uh, Ghana, Anthony Morrison, uh, who had some thoughts to share about technocrats rather than politicians managing agriculture. Centralization process of PFJ and any other form of uh, subsidies should go directly. MOFA should focus on what they need to do need to and get idea. the Department of Agriculture to actually drive agriculture project implementations in the country. Mm -hmm. And that is the only way we can begin to see results. So you are saying that take politicians out of agric. That's it. And leave it to the technocrats? Technical directors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Leave it to the key implementers. Mm -hmm. And the key implementers, the value chain, the farmers, the input importers, and also the coordinators. But what role then do you reserve for the politicians? Well, let them focus on policy and let the experts actually now look at those who are not able to deliver based on their target and they should punish for it. But when you have the politicians interfering, the other side of punishment or having the project taken from them is not able to get it achieved. Let's empower NDPC to police the ministries. The ministries have become so, uh, they've, they've become more like, uh, they've made NDPC like the proletariat and the uh, ministries have become like the bourgeoisies. Yeah. A lot of resources going to the ministries. The NDPC that needs to actually police national policy to make sure that the ministries, the agencies are delivering or the national mandate are not being resourced well enough. We need the NDPC to be like the IGP of Ghana policy and make sure that if a ministry fails to deliver on their mandate this year, they are reprimanded. Mm. They are given maybe a lower budget. So next time, if they do not have the right competent people, they ask them to go for refresher training. Okay. Because mm -hmm. we are having a lot of wastage in at the ministry. Well, there was still more. Associate Professor of Agricultural Economics at the University of Ghana, Professor Edward Ebo Onuma, uh, also suggested that government ought to establish poultry processing factories to ease the burden on uh, farmers. He believed that such factories would significantly enhance the efficiency and productivity of poultry farming in the country. 1960, we're doing about 12% importation of poultry. Now we are doing over 85%. Why? Um, we have the imported, you know, uh, poultry meat in cut parts. It's processed in cut part. So can I see a government that would want to establish a factory, a processing uh, factory, one at the north, one in the middle, one at the south, and then all the farmers are empowered, take your goods there, process them, and then it's well packaged. Now, that is not enough. Let's go to the various, um, um, what, uh, hotels and, uh, for instance, papaya, if you go with the chicken, people are consuming, we talk to all of them. Now, this year, there is a policy that take a chunk or a certain percentage from what Ghana is doing in terms of uh, the chicken processing. I think that it will go a long way. We should be specific. Okay. We should be targeted mm. in what we do. We also had the General Secretary of the General Agricultural Workers Union, uh, Edward Carraway, urging government to address climate change in 
uh, its manifesto and political parties as well. He explained that crop yields were low because the lands were being damaged by climate change. Look at the climate change. We also have a version of the climate change. I can imagine that people think that climate change is something that is in Europe, it has been caused by Europeans or some people somewhere, and we are now feeling the brunt. What about our own contribution? If climate change is partly uh, caused by human activity, what do we do to cause climate change? And today, it's not surprising at all when Dr. Charles indicated that prices are supposed to be coming down around this time because we are supposed to be harvesting, particularly the southern sector. Why are we not harvesting enough? It's all because, not only about the rain, it's also because the lands are destroyed. If you look at the, when we started with Galamse, and consistently, we've been destroying the land which is never reclaimed. I am, I don't know how much of irrigation, I mean, Galamse land that has been destroyed has been uh, reclaimed. reclaimed. Is if anything at all is insignificant. So that's the conversation we head into next on the AM show. How will these political parties who are vying for our votes, how will they address agriculture, the lifeblood of our economy? Well, we know that service and all of that has been doing pretty well, but how about agriculture? How about our cocoa? How about other things? Well, we get into that conversation. We have joining uh, us Dr. Peter Bwama Otokuno. He is with the NDC, and of course, he is an agri economist and a chartered uh, financial economist as well. He joins uh, the conversation. Doc, good morning. You would have to unmute so I can hear you. Good morning, Ben. Good morning, and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure having you. Uh, just off the top of my head, I don't know whether you followed this conversation yesterday, but how crucial is Agric, that manifesto, ahead of election 2024? I've heard you say, for example, that, and this was just last month, or should I say two months ago, because we, we've just entered August, that there's no policy document for planting for food and jobs and all of that. You see some of the problems. How crucial is it for us to fix these problems ahead of election 2024 in our party manifestos? Okay, first of all, let me emphasize that the Ghanaian economy, as it were, is supposed to be an agrarian economy. And that means that if you look at our economic structure, agriculture is one of the key uh, elements of the structure. And so we are we run a three sector economy. We have agriculture, industry, and services. And you would realize that agriculture has been doing somewhat around 19.7%, 20% in the past few years. But what people do not know is that agriculture is an aspect of the economy which has implications or effect on industry and services. If agriculture does well, it means that industry will do well and services will do well. That means that any government that would target a focus on agriculture would exponentially grow the economy and create jobs. But let's come to the problem of agriculture in Ghana. I think that the problem of agriculture, which is leading us to, I mean, close to food insecurity as a result of high food prices and the low nutrition on availability of food, inconsistent supply of food. We have seen in the past few uh, months, the price hikes in food, uh, some of the food items, we are not able to get them, some we have to import and all those things. It's actually the key problem of this economy, because if you look at our macro economy, you look at the, the fiscal challenges we are having, you look at the exchange rate challenges we are having, all can be traced down to agriculture. And so fundamentally fixing the problem of agriculture would ultimately fix the problem of this country. Indeed, there is no developed country in the world that does not prioritize agriculture or that its, de its development or its growth was not driven by agriculture. And so the need to focus on agriculture uh, cannot be overemphasized. But let's look at the issue of agriculture. Let's look at the problem of agriculture. I would want to break down the problem of agriculture into maybe, let's say, um, three broad themes. Uh, the demographic problems, 
the socioeconomic problems, and the institutional problems. Let me first of all start with the demographic problem. We know in Ghana, agriculture is mainly a smallholder activity. Smallholder means individual households, families, some are women, some are men, and they, they, they cultivate five acres of land, and some cultivate one acre, some cultivate two acres. So in small bits and pieces. And so you have almost about 40% of your population in agriculture, but they are mainly smallholder farmers, and it is contributing 20%. So what it means is that when you tackle you tackle productivity level, productivity at a smallholder level, you improve their technical efficiency and their output increases. You would ultimately be, you know, inching closer to achieving your objectives in agriculture. And so, we must look at the challenges at the smallholder level, the the, the household income, the off farm income, because all these things play in the performance or the efficiency of the farmer. If you have a farmer, a farm household that is led by a woman, the woman has no alternative jobs. All she does is agriculture throughout the year. And you have one season of rainfall, or let's say you have two seasons of rainfall. How can the person be able to grow to feed the nation? You won't be able to do that. And so there would be some lacuna, an input lacuna that must be addressed. And I'll come uh, uh, to that very soon. Then there are the socioeconomic factors which mainly has to do with input cost, cost of production. So the input cost is so high because most of the inputs that we use, the agrochemicals, the fertilizer, are all imported. Fertilizer is now almost 450 Ghana per bag. Agrochemicals, I mean, exceedingly high. If you look at the growth rate prices in agrochemicals, it will shock you. And so the farmer who has waited for one year to get to the farming season, so that he can grow some tomato, he can grow some onion, he can grow some vegetables or some grains. We now have to struggle to go and look for money to be able to buy these inputs in order to cultivate. He can't buy fertilizer because he has no other alternative income. There is no uh, 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 um, sources of funds, access to credit for those farmers. In Ghana, it is very difficult to assess credit. And as you may be aware, the collapse of the financial uh, institutions some time ago right. collapsed most of these local financial institutions that were giving them agro credit and so they do not have these banks around to have access to agro credit and that is one of the key problems of agriculture production in ghana and so what happens is that because the input costs are high if they are able to struggle and mix raise some money to go and buy the agro inputs and produce the cost of production is now high that means that they would have to find a way to sell the commodities to be able to make profits or as it were break even and that brings the food prices high and that is the reason why we are having high inf inflation rate and all that then there is the issue about the institutional uh, uh, challenges the institutional challenges have to do with the policy framework that we put in place as a country for agriculture and i have recounted uh, how I have struggled to get the PFJ2 document, and still I have not gotten it. Yesterday, I posted on my Facebook asking one of the MPs who was making a case for agriculture production and the fact that we are doing very well in food supply, that he should give me a copy of the PFJ1 report and maybe a, a copy of the PFJ2 uh, policy document. So we have not been able to see clearly the target, the focus, of, of the program. So you, you admit, you admit that that is problematic. We've had planting for food and jobs, one and two. We've had rearing uh, for food and jobs, among others. You admit that's a problem. How do we fix it? Because without policy documentation, it would be haphazard implementation. How do we fix that? And, and I also want you to situate the conversation because we spoke to these people also feeding into how our political parties would implement them in their manifestos. You represent the National Democratic Congress. What's the way forward on that? So let me make this point that I have also engaged some of the um, the officers or the technocrats you 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 had on your program. Um, I've engaged the Pisan Farmers Association. We've engaged GAU. We've engaged the Ghana Farmers and Fishermen Association. And most importantly, their biggest problem is policy credibility and the policy implementation processes. Mostly, it has been taken over by rent-seekers, politicians, 
who are not even ag agriculturists or farmers, and they take the input, some of them hoard them, and it gets to a point where they are expiring, and they bring them to the market, beg people to buy and all that. And so the issue of rent seeking and policy efficiency has become a problem. And that is one thing that as a political party, we are hoping to cure. But most importantly, let me dwell on the, the, the policy framework, exactly what must go into an effective agricultural policy framework. First of all, the policy framework must address the issue of production. And so the production, the cost, there is a need for subsidy, how the subsidy regime is, is programmed. Now, the kind of subsidy regime we have seen is just to favor some few private political you know, businessmen. And so you have a case where the entire input distribution system for a policy like PFJ given to two or three companies, they bring in all the agrochemicals, they control the agrochemical market, and they do the supply. There is no means to check whether indeed even the subsidy is being responsive, whether the, the, the farmers are benefiting from the subsidy. So the subsidy do not go to the farmers. And like, as I've heard for the PFJ too, the, the, the vendors that have been selected are supposed to supply the agrochemicals to the farmers, then um, the, the government would, would pay them after a point in time. And uh, the proposal again has been, let's give the, the, the agrochemicals to the farmers when they harvest their crops, we buy the crops, then we deduct the cost of the agrochemicals from it and give them the difference and all that. And all this is shrouded in some opaque arrangements, which uh, nobody understands. And that affects the effectiveness of the policy. You heard the, the, the association uh, complaining about the fact that they were not even consulted in most part of the arrangements and all that. So the institutional arrangement to design these policies are very crucial. When you have dealt with the issue of production, now the biggest problem, again, is access to markets. So how do we assess the markets? Now we are in the tomato season. Already farmers are complaining that their tomatoes are ready and it is getting spoiled. And what, what is the problem? The problem is that the transportation systems are poor, the, the aggregation systems are poor, the access to the markets are poor. And so you would grow the, the tomato, you would harvest the tomato, but you, you would get clots. I mean, it would you know, post-harvest management would be a problem and you will lose out as a farmer. And so the policy framework must address the, the marketing structures that we use to market our agro inputs. And every agro input and the kind of structures that you have to put in place for their marketing. If you don't do it very well, you would have prices. And most importantly, most importantly- I want you to, I want you to wrap on that point. To, I, I want to move on to something else, but you wrap on that point very quickly for me. Yes. The most important one is the misalignment of agricultural production to food. We have misaligned the food systems and the agricultural production systems. And these are two different things. And mostly we focus our policies on the, the agricultural production, which fails anyway because of the, the, the policy inefficiencies. But most importantly, we don't link it to food. Now, in Ghana, Almost every table eats tomatoes. And so if every table eats tomatoes, and we are importing almost about 800,000 metric tons of tomatoes at the current rate, in fact, as of 2022, we were spending almost 570 million Ghana city on importing uh, 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 tomatoes. Now it's almost about $400 million on tomatoes alone. So you know that the country eats a lot of tomatoes. So what you do is that you focus your policies in a way to grow tomatoes throughout the season, because tomato also is a seasonal crop. And the reason why mostly off-season we import from Burkina Faso is that they have advanced irrigation systems and they are able to produce around the clock the year. And so how do we focus our policy to make sure that we produce tomatoes throughout the year? And so we know the agroecological zones where we grow tomatoes, four main agroecological zones. And so let's make sure that there are adequate irrigation facilities in those areas so that they will be able to grow throughout the year. When you are able to grow throughout the year, you would be able to supply the needed uh, uh, quantity of tomatoes that you need throughout the year. And for that matter, maintain a low price for tomatoes. Now you are aware that we spend 40% of our household income, 40% on just tomatoes alone other commodities have not come in. And so when you know your food, what you consume, then you link your policy to what to produce. So you, you do the production, 
but it is linked to food. Now in Ghana, our food is what we don't produce. Most of the food we eat on our table, french fries, the indomies, and all those things, are food that we do not produce in Ghana. And what it means is that you always put pressure on your forex because you have to import them. And so if you are able to link your food to what you produce, then you would be able to be producing locally, cut down importation, and that's where import substitution comes in. All so right. most of the most part of the food ingredients that you use right. would, would, would be grown in the economy. Then finally, as part of the policy, you look at an agro processing of value addition program, which would, as it were, agro industrialize and add value. Because the thing about food security is that it has four legs. And convenience is one of them. Convenience. People will eat the food because it is convenient and easy for them. For example, Indomie has become very popular because people will just pour water on it and three minutes is ready. And so if you are going to spend two hours to prepare food or a banku, you would rather go for Indomie to save time. And so our agro-industrialization or agro-processing regime to target how to make our food that we eat more convenient in terms of processing. So I love yam and palava sauce, but it will take a long time and some inconvenience for my wife to peel the yam, put it on fire and boil and all that. How do we look at processing yam? How do we look at processing cassava? How do we look at processing plantain, for example? So that just as you go to the shop and buy French fries and just pour it into the oil and you have your French fries, we can have some products that are generated from our local foods, which are produced here, and be able to save the economy. Right. And so these are things that are very crucial that must make space in, 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 in policy. I'm glad that you're saying it must make space in policy. I'll get there shortly. You've, you've already spoken about the misalignment of our great production, the lacuna or lacunae in uh, some of ben, the, the inputs among, among others. Uh, ben, I lost you briefly. I am saying that you've mentioned a number of things, just, just to be uh, brief on that. But there's also not, I wouldn't call it emerging because it is with us, GMOs. And in recent times, we've had quite a conversation on it. There are those who still believe no. It is not the right way to go. There are many problems with it. And there are those, like the CSR, who think, well, it's a good way to go. What is our positioning, especially on the back of food security? What is your party considering in terms of GMOs? The CSR is doing some work on that. But is it, is it what we need now? Is it in the right direction? Is it positive from where you sit? What would be your approach to GMOs as a party? First, let me start off by saying that the role of biotechnology in food security cannot be overemphasized. And if you don't improve your foods, you can't improve your productivity. If you don't improve your seeds, you can't improve on your productivity. Because, uh, I mean, as we have it, the productivity of every farm depends on the kind of input you put in there. You put garbage in, you get garbage out. Our maize seeds that we were producing in Ghana were yielding about one uh, uh, metric ton per, hec per acre or per hectare. Uh, there are improved breeds through biotechnology developed by the crop science department and even CSR before the advent of GM, which would shoot our average productivity or yield per hectare to about 2.5 and 3 uh, metric tons per hectare. And I believe that was some significant improvement through biotechnology. Now, the other aspect of biotechnology is what you call the GM. And so the GMO looks at some challenges of the crops and uh, um, design some biotechnology instruments to cure the challenges. For example, you have some crops that like cowpea that are attacked by the borers. And so you are designing, you are pulling out some genetic components of those borers and infusing it into the seed. Uh, uh, DNA so that you would be able to produce a seed that would not attract the borers or the borers will not even come near and come and worry you as pests. So you don't need pesticides anymore. You may not need weedicides anymore when you grow a uh, certain crops. And that is the whole idea about biotechnology. But most importantly, the challenge we have had with biotechnology in terms of GM is that when you are able to grow those seeds to that level, it means that those seeds will not be replantable. 
And again, you know, naturally God created the ecosystem in such a way that... So, so you're saying they would be sterile, people, right? Yes, they would, they would be sterile. And all those um, pests and weedicides help in the ecosystem to make the ecosystem stable and sustainable. And so when you take those things out, then it means that the ecosystem will not be sustainable. In fact, we, we, we passed the plant biodiversity and seed production bill some time back. And that is why um, CSIR is, you know, exploring all those options. Now, when you go elsewhere in the advanced markets, when you go to the markets, they are able to tell you that this one is a GMO commodity. This one is organic commodity. And so those are things that we have to put in place as part of policy so that if anybody would want to grow a GMO commodity, you don't stop the person because the person is free to produce that commodity. But also at the market end, the consumers should be able to select between a GMO commodity and an organic commodity. So what are you but saying? What, what are you saying? What are you market, saying? Uh, so, so Mr. Bama, so please, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me make this point. What are you saying yeah. is that as far as you are concerned, and likely, because I'll be asking next how that feeds into your party's manifesto, which will be dropping from what I've heard this month. We are already in August. What that means is that the NDC is not against GMOs, but you want categorization, for example, so that people will be able to select between GMO foods and organic foods without any uh, genetic modification. That's what you're saying. I am saying that there is a need for us to regulate GMOs production in Ghana. So you are not against GMOs? We have some challenges with the connection to Dr. Peter Buama Otokuno. We'll try to uh, regulate that. We'll try to see whether we can get uh, him back so that we can hear everything he's saying. And there's a reason I'm putting him to the sword on that point, so that when we see their manifesto, we can reconcile what was said and what is in the manifesto. Of course, we want to see what their approach will be to genetically uh, modified organisms as far as our agri-sector is is uh, concerned. Uh, Dr. Otokuno, can you hear me now? I, I, I didn't quite catch what you said. So I was saying that it was part of our seed production. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Can just, you hear just start from the point about yeah, GMOs. Yeah. Yes, so I was making the point that GMO has its own limitations and it has its own advantages. There would be a need to regulate so that Ghana can benefit from the advantages of GMOs. And as I have said, we have been doing biotechnology since the days of you remember the sheep called uh, the, the Nungwa black sheep. That was a, a genetically, you know, improved breed at the Ligon farms. We have the tamale yellow uh, uh, maize that was developed. And there are about almost 75 varieties of maize that have been developed through biotechnology. And most importantly, some would classify biotechnology as uh, genetically modified, you know, foods. But there is an extent to which you can do that modification. And that is why government must regulate the extent to which scientists will be, uh, 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 as it were, modifying those seeds. But again, let's look at the, the, the seed production regime. Ghana imports most of our seeds. Currently, there is no regulation regime that uh, uh, looks at the sources of the seeds that come into the, 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 the economy or into the country. So EPA has a role to play. Other institutions from Ministry of Agri have a role to play. But most of the seeds that come in, there is no means to check whether the extent of modification, the, I mean, genetic modification, as I said, has so many extents. Some, they infuse certain genes from animals. For example, if you use a gene from pork or pig into a seed and you generate a genetically modified feed based on some genes from pigs, the Muslims wouldn't be able to eat that, that seed. And so those are things that a regulatory regime should be able to check and know the extent of modification of the kind of seeds that we are bringing into the economy. And I think that that is something that our policies will be looking at. We are very strong and very keen on right. some of these things and the extent of the modification, even though we don't want to sacrifice that on the author of productivity improvements. All right, so let's focus now. The last angle I want you to look at is the manifesto. 
and Agric, like you rightly mentioned, Agric feeds into service. It is literally the backbone of our economic life. How, what shape will the NDC's manifesto take when it comes to agriculture? For example, you have the bit about fertilizers. And now we also have to pay keen attention to them because some of those fertilizers also create issues with our climate, in, you know, including climate change. Pesticides, agric extension offices, planting for food and jobs and all of that. Like, what can we expect from the NDC in terms of your manifesto when it comes to agriculture? You have about three minutes to expand on, on that, and then we'll wrap. Okay. So um, we are proposing, as announced by President Mahama, an agriculture for economic transformation program, a bigger program that will harness um, food crop development. We'll be looking at grains development program. We'll be looking at vegetable development program. We'll be looking at livestock development program. And so most importantly, our protein provision or livestock development program should be linked to the grain sector. And so what we are saying is that there must be for policy to address the initial challenges that I raised, that has to do with access to credit, that has to do with access to cheaper inputs and all that. And so how do we use the kind of pesticides that we use? Do we have and can we have local fertilizers like composting, like organic fertilizer? be used more by the farmers instead of the inorganic fertilizers that may have negative implications on the soil quality and the environment. Do we use local remedies for pesticides, for example, that will help us to, those are things that we are going to look at. So under the Agriculture for Economic Transformation Program, we are looking for, a, we are looking at a stimulus arrangement that will get most of the agro inputs produced here in Ghana, so that we'll be able to cut down the cost of these agro inputs like fertilizer and so on and so forth. We would recall that before we left power in 2016, we had made an arrangement for a compost plant to be uh, um, set up in Ghana so that we'll produce more compost for those who would want to apply organic fertilizer on their farms to increase uh, productivity. I don't know what has happened to the compost plant uh, Amasaman that was built uh, by, I think, Zoom Lion or so. But those are the areas that we have to look at. I have seen on TV Kantanka doing a lot of stuff on, you know, uh, producing uh, locally manufactured pesticides and weedicides, for example, which we can look at industrializing and producing more in Ghana so that we would be able to control the prices. Because with the current exchange rate crisis that we are having, if we continue on the spree of importing agro inputs like fertilizer, weedicides, and pesticides, I bet you agriculture would be very unsustainable. You know, there's an association for input dealers who also thrives on their business survival, and it is their business to bring in these commodities. There would be a need for government to engage so that most of the tariff regime or some of the uh, subsidies that they are given, or if you want the tax exemptions that they are given, can be remodeled in such a way that they use those incentives to set up manufacturing plants here so that we produce them here, so that we don't put pressure on our exchange rate. When we are able to do that, we believe that we'll be able to increase productivity in our grains, for example, to product specialization. And that is one key aspect of the policy. Right. You must do product specialization. Know the kind of food crop commodities that you are producing. Target. So you target maize, you target soya bean, you target rice, you target sorghum, you target millet. These four components, when you are able to focus and not spread your resources wide, you would be able to improve the production of those ones because the livestock sector also relies strongly on the maize and soya beans. As we speak, for the past five months, uh, sorry, for the past one month, I've been looking for soya bean to buy for my farm, and I'm not able to get soya bean anywhere. I am struggling to get for one month now. I needed only 100 bucks, and it's a problem. And so the, that is a challenge. Meanwhile, we have, I mean, from the middle belt, the, uh, the forest savanna zone, middle transition zone, up to the north, is a place where you can grow soya bean, and it does well anywhere. So why are we struggling with soya beans? Now we have a challenge with our policies even on soya bean. So we do exportation of our soya beans or we have a, a legal regime or legislative regime that will stop the exportation of soya beans. Because right. now we import eggs. Ben, I don't know whether you are aware we import eggs in Ghana. Eggs, eggs are imported. How? 
how as a country like Ghana, why should we import eggs? But it is mainly because the food cost for, for, for the poultry industry has gone exceedingly high. Eight years ago, you would buy one bag of feed for about 60 Ghana cities. Now you are buying one bag of feed for almost 400 Ghana cities. And that is even the mixed feed. If you are looking at the raw feed ingredients where you do your own mixing. Maize, as, as of today, is 350 Ghana cities per 50 kilos. And I think that is exceedingly high. That is unsustainable okay. for any farmer to right. indulge in. And if indeed farmers are going to produce right. at this rate, then it means that very soon you may be buying eggs at 80 Ghana CD or 90 Ghana CD per crate. Well, these are all issues that we hope to see you address in your party's manifesto, like you promised, um, around the middle of this month, or at least by close of the month. Dr. Peter Bwabo Otokuno, we are grateful for your time. Thank you for joining the conversation. Thank you for having me. And of course, he is an agricultural economist. He is also a deputy general secretary of the NDC. And as we tackle this matter from the political parties, we'll be bringing other political parties as well to share their thoughts on uh, this sector.